When John Kennedy was running for president, he came to my neighborhood. It was the hottest day, like, had in a century. It's like 9,000 degrees. And people came from all over Manhattan to my neighborhood to see this guy who talked about my country and my part in it. This was the coolest thing. I was like seven or eight. Well, it simply meant that, you know, this was my country. This guy who was going to be the president was coming to my neighborhood to tell me that he was thinking of me, you know. I mean, because I took it very personally, you know. I, I thought it was very, very cool. And I'm a big believer in whistle stop. You know, I believe it's good for the people you're supposed to represent to see you you know, to feel your essence, so that you as a politician know that when you're setting legislation, you're setting, setting it for real people, you know, people who, who will, you know, be affected by what you decide. Oh, birth from birth. I knew as soon as I hit that light, <laughs> I was waving. It's always been. It's, it's, uh, it's as much a part of my whole being as breathing. I always knew this was it. I didn't know it was going to be like this, you know. But I always knew that I wanted to act, you know. And I grew up in a time when it would never have occurred to anyone to tell me there was anything I couldn't do, you know. Uh, I grew up in a time when the country was very pro the people who lived in it. That's why as many changes were able to happen. The March on Washington came into to reality. People really believed that they had a stake in the country. So there were all kinds of invitations to make the country better. So there was never any, for me, uh, any one saying, no, you're going to fail, or no, there's no place for you. The only thing my mom ever said to me was, you know, it may be tough, you know, but what isn't, you know? Come on, <laughs> come on, you know? Be an actor because you love to act. Don't be an actor because you think you're going to get famous, because that's luck. But if it's what you want to do with your whole heart and soul, come on. Go everywhere. Learn everything. Learn Shakespeare. Shakespeare's great fun. Don't be thrown by the words. The words are the same words that we use, you know, with a little different uh, implementation, you know. Uh, write things for yourself. Come on. It's a great way to spend time. It's a great way to learn history. You know, it's a great way to learn all kinds of things. But only come if you come into play. If you're not coming to play, you should get another gig to supplement your acting, you know. I'm a dyslexic, so there weren't a whole lot of books in my life early on with words. But I, I, I did love stories. I love fairy tales, and I love spooky stories, and you know, anything with a good 25 to 30 minute brain trip for me to go on. I still like to be read to, you know. So when I was a kid, there was no such they didn't call it dyslexia. They called it, you know, slow or you were retarded or whatever. Uh, and so uh, I learned from a guy who was running a program who I met one day, and he had written out on a board a sentence. And I said to him, I, you know, I can't read that. And he said, why not? And I said, because doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, I, so he said, well, write down what you see. Under each, whatever you see, write exactly what you see underneath. And so uh, he brought me 
two letters by coordinating what I saw to something called an A or a B or a C or a D. And that was pretty cool. Um, and once you got into the habit of doing things, it became much easier. But you know, there are all kinds of things, and probably by the time people see this in you know 2025, they will have been able to eliminate it. You know, they will be able to eliminate it with just an adjustment. You know, a little implant. But what you can never change is the effect that the words dumb and stupid have on young people. So we must always be vigilant when those two words get stuck in our throat. Hey, dummy, God, you're so stupid. You know, just remember that those, what those leave you with are forever, you know, be it in 1810 or 4010, do you know? The effect that they have is, is the same. So I knew I wasn't stupid, and I knew I wasn't dumb. My mother told me that, and everybody told me I wasn't stupid or dumb, but what else could you be if you couldn't read? You know, if you read to me, I could tell you everything that you read, you know. And people call you names in frustration because then they didn't know what it was. They thought, well, they knew I wasn't lazy, you know. But what was it? You know, it's like in, the, in those early days, and this may be a good cut point for you, but we'll see. In the early days, when little girls complained about having cramps, their mothers and their mother's mothers and their mother's mothers were just sort of left to deal with it because it was all in your head. Well, it took, you know, 25, 30 years for people to understand that menstrual cramps are a real thing. They're a real thing. That PMS is a real chemical change in the body. But think of all those little girls whose mothers said to them, why do you just want attention? You know, we learn things, but the way that those things affect us as grown people stay with us. I suspect that will happen less as we progress, but we're still dealing with it because it's still relatively new information for us now, 1994. You know, it's still new information that these things are actual body problems or, or uh, postpartum depression is now a real viable thing and they can help people, you know. Sitting at the table uh, during Color Purple and looking up and suddenly realizing I was acting in front of Steven Spielberg was pretty cool. It was pretty good. Because it was like suddenly I got it. I was there. I, I was in a movie. <laughs> Not only was I in the movie, but I had a big part in the movie, you know. And I just started laughing and laughing and, you know, it took about 25 minutes to compose myself. But it was pretty remarkable because, you know, there was, there was an idea whose time had come for me, you know. And that it was with Steven Spielberg was pretty cool. It was pretty cool, I have to say. I liked it. <laughs> I would like to do it again, <laughs> one day. It was very cool, because I used to make speeches when I was a kid, you know, thanking all the little people and, you know. And then suddenly there I was having to make a real speech, you know. I touch them every day. I move them from one place to the other and then back, you know. Oh, yes. I liked it. I mean, when else are you going to get to play with a, several billion people, you know? It's just one more thing I could write in my diary. Dear diary, play for two billion today. <laughs> You know, I just have this whole book of things that, is, that uh, I've gotten to do. Got to play at the White House. 
you know, which is kind of neat. I've gotten to play in front of two billion people. I've been all over the world. I've met amazing people, you know. Life can be grand. Be tough, but it could be grand. I am the American dream. I am the epitome of what the American dream basically said. It said you could come from anywhere and be anything you want in this country. That's exactly what I've done, you know. Uh, the great divide between my era and the eras that come after me is that you are not getting the encouragement and the hands on from your government. Uh, a lot of times your teachers have been left out in the cold, so it's hard for them to focus the way that teachers were focused when I was a kid. There's not a lot of work out there as there were when I was a kid. We had programs that were set up by the country. So the fact that you are making it now makes you 5,000 times the person that those who came before you were. Because we had a lot of help, and there's very little help out there now. I grew up in Manhattan in New York, a place called Chelsea. And I grew up around lots of different people. So we all grew up speaking a smattering of Greek, Italian, Spanish, uh, Indian, uh, Chinese, Yiddish. Uh, and it was great. I had a great time because I was in New York. And, you know, in the olden days, which is when I was a kid, uh, there were all sorts of things to play with, you know and to go and be part of, which, you know, now you do on things like this, on interactive. But we, uh, we had a different sort of life. <laughs> you couldn't go and talk to Leonard Bernstein. You could only go watch him conduct, something I'm very sorry for. I can't speak for what they were. I was, I was comfortable, and I never, I knew we weren't Rockefellers, you know, but it never was a, an issue with us because we went to places we needed to go, Coney Island, we went on the Circle Line, we had Central Park, we had things you could do for like not tons of money. So I truly don't know what my mom was doing financially. I, I know that uh, we ate and, you know, wasn't the, wasn't the times as they are now. I don't know that my mother could have achieved all she achieved on her income today, you know. In today's market, at her income level, I'm sure we would be dirt poor. But then, we weren't. I have two theories on that. I have two theories on that. One theory is that I believe that when people die, the spirit flies from them and fragments and goes into opening beings, people who are just coming into being. And I believe I got hit with a lot of fragments from various people. That's my first theory. I believe that we we keep the circle. The circle isn't an, you know, doesn't break. It just reinvents and stuff. The other thing is, I just love the idea that I could go be uh, a princess from Greenland in the movies, and it's cool, you know. And there's no one to say no. You can't be from Greenland, you know. There's no one saying you can't be from Hungary, you know. So the idea that you can go into the past, the present, and the future, you know. I just think it's too cool. I think I'm one of those people who was affected really, truly by everybody that I met in a very magical kind of way. 
you know, I feel a bit like the golden child, you know, but you only know that when you look back, you know, and see the people who touched you and how, you know, friends and, and camp counselors and uh, people who denied your humanity that you overcame, you know, all those people who said you couldn't and you shouldn't and you won't and you, sh you will never, you know, and you did. You know, all those people affected me and, and went into making me the sum total of what I, I became and what I've become. But there are people who, whose goal in life was to instill the positive ideal that you could go forward, that anything you wanted was yours for the taking, you know, with a commitment to hard work and knowing that it wasn't always going to be easy. And uh, people who taught me that the hardest thing to be truly in this world is someone who disagrees with popular people, you know, to take unpopular stances in front of popular people. It's easy to be unpopular with unpopular people, but it's harder to be unpopular with popular people. And that, the people that have instilled that in me also, I take my hat off to. Because that, that, I think, is the foundation that has allowed me to do exactly as I pleased, <laughs> you know, and be and look just like I want to. I don't know if it's guts. I think it is, I think, it, I think of guts as something that like gives you that Kirk Douglas look. But I think what I mean is the knowledge that it is okay to feel differently than the pack. That that is a fundamental right. That it's okay to disagree. It's better to be able to disagree and have a dialogue than to go along with the pack and be truly unhappy. I don't want to be truly unhappy. I mean, there's enough out there to piss me off, you know, to bother me. I'm sorry, there's enough out there to bother me. Yes, I was a teapot. I was a small teapot, short and stout. Here was my handle, this was my spout. Um, and I was like seven. It's the greatest. I just kept bowing and <laughs> they had to come get me off the stage. I just kept bowing. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. You know, all the other pots are gone. <laughs> Born ham. That's basically me. It's the truth. My mom told it to me, because I'd forgotten it. But she what well, she also tells the story of my birth. I, I'm I'm almost half kidding when I say I came out and waved. Uh, my mother says that I came out head, arm, other arm, thumb and mouth immediately. And they were astounded because generally that's not what you do. They have to clear, no, I was born clear, you know? And they just kept calling people <laughs> to come. She said I was hanging out, thumb in my mouth. Some people are just born that way. Born talker. We are all born. We're born with success. It is only others who point out our failures or what they attribute to us as failure. Uh, I think the idea that you know who your inner self is, you know, on a daily basis, because, you know, what's good for you 25 years ago may not be good for you now. So to keep in touch with that, that's the, that's the, uh, I think the, the first ingredient for success. Because if you're a successful human being, you know, everything else is gravy, I think. People uh, expecting me to be perhaps more than I am, expecting me to live to their expectations when perhaps I can't, 
you know, and people forgetting that I get cranky and I get crabby and I don't always want to be Whoopi Goldberg, you know. I, I just, it's, some days I'm not in the mood, you know. Um, the lack of privacy is tough. Uh, I went to the bathroom once and people followed me in the lady put her hand up under the stall with a pen and a piece of paper and wanted my autograph. I said, can I just finish what I'm doing first? So sometimes people just forget or they grab you and they don't realize that, you know, you're a, a person <laughs> that like feels, or they grab my hair, a little, people grab my hair and go, whoopee, and not realize that, you know, I, I don't mind saying hello, but hey, you know, that hurt. You know, when, you, when you're rushing or you're preoccupied and you just can't stop, you know, people aren't always understanding. And so you feel bad because you don't want them to think ill of you. And you come to the place where you say, you know what, too bad. I have to go. So that's kind of tough. I think I'm off-center. I think... <laughs> I think for the most part, the reality is I'm, I'm quite off-center. And, you know, it's a, it's a daily workout of trying to implement those things that you believe. And it's hard sometimes, and I'm cranky and crabby, as I said, you know. And I'm not always, I don't always practice what I, pe I preach, but I do pay for it when I realize that I haven't. Uh, so just being human, just being human. It's, it's a lot of work being here. You know, you add the celebrity on top of that, it's, it's like 45 lives.